Okay, this week, Pete Sugarman and I ran a virtual field trip to the Triborough Sand and Stone Company, which is in uh, Gibbs Borough, New Jersey. It's located here. This is the operating pit today. Uh, there is a parking area here with a delightful series of trails uh, put in by the town of Gibbsboro. We walked our way in. Uh, Pete had been here a couple of times, uh, most recently a couple of years ago. This was actually the site of a 1988 uh, Friends of the Pleistocene field trip, and we wanted to check out the outcrops, and we saw some rather good exposures. So again, this is where the Triborough Pit is. Gibbs Town's here. For those of you who don't know, know South Jersey, there's Cherry Hill, and here's my hometown of Medford. Um, the pit exposes the Bridgeton Formation, which is Upper Miocene, and as we will see, is fluvial. It exposes the Cohansey Formation, which has an inferred age of somewhere in the middle to Upper Miocene, roughly 10 to 12 million years uh, ago. Poorly dated, though. Uh, the bridge has almost no age constraints um, with near shore sands, mostly in the Cohansey, and that overlies the Kirkwood formation, which is middle to lower Miocene, mostly shelf sands, although some have a strong deltaic influence. And I would just reverse, I would just meaningless note, but lower to middle, I would just switch that. Oh, yeah, yes, right? okay, good point. Um, all right, so. Let me just fix that. Yeah. Uh, yes. This, this is uh, there. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, this is from Newell's at Al's Southeast Friends of the Pleistocene Field Trip Guide, and it gives you a kind of a feel for the ages of these units, including overlying Pleistocene units, which are called the Cape May Formation. The Pensac and gravels are inferred to be uh, Pliocene in age, and they actually are lower in elevation uh, than the Bridgeton gravels. So these are all gravels that are tend to hold up the hills and the quest of topography of the coastal plain, which is eroding down. Uh, the Cohansey formation overlies the Kirkwood, and again, this is uh, the these are typical marine strata with fluvial strata uh, overlaying them. The uh, Bridgeton Formation gravels are shown here in an older map from 1950 updated by New et al. Shows the location of the Triborough Pit at one of these gravels that are exposed primarily in the uh, southern part of the state of New Jersey with some other uh, hills being held up by Bridgeton gravels here. To quote from Newell et al., the Bridgeton consists of highly weathered red to orange brown, poorly sorted, cross bedded, arcosic, fine gravel, coarse grained sand deposits. Okay, and basically the pebbly coarse sands. Um, the Cohansey formation and the underlying Kirkwood formation, this is showing a map of the Kirkwood by Sugarman et al., 1983. Uh, they strike north by northeast and are sub-parallel to the current coastline. Uh, at Triborough, Newell reports two facies, cross-bedded facies uh, of, meet, of coarse to medium sand, and a burrowed find of coarse sand. Uh, we'd call the latter probably the Kirkwood formation here. Um, it, in an interesting quote from them also, they note that the Bridgeton formation is differentiated from the Cohansey because it's what they would call an ortho quartzite. In other words, it's clean quartz sand, not much feldspar in it. So this is the pit. We came in on these series of trails and then came down into this north uh, side of the pit, which is shown here. Uh, we walked along and we'll see a west face uh, on the west side and worked our way down to this uh, ponded area and looked at a face over here on the west side. Uh, sh I should note that I'll show you videos and you'll see a lot of red staining. This almost looks like Sedona, Arizona, famed for its <laughs> red rocks. Pete's laughing because he's been to Sedona. Yes, beautiful. Well, the red, as in the red in Sedona, these were originally white uh, cross-bedded sands of the Cohansey Formation, 
that underlie the the uh, Bridgeton gravel. So these are gravels here, gravels there. Uh, but this is a pervasive iron stain and it comes down and it's mostly on the surface. And when you clean the surfaces off, you see something different. So when you walk in, it's not exactly what you expect. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. This is one of that North Face going from the West side. What's the name of this pit? Blueberry So we're taking a few screenshots. There's one more video that starts out blurry, but soon will come so crystal clear. You can see the gravels. Focus, there we go. And as you come over There's here. some of the gravels. Gravels. You can see the gravels. With the cross bedded orange sands above. And then we have these cross bedded sands below. So the sands above seem to be more unidirectional. They have coarse gravel channel fills and interpreted as fluvial. Here in the reddish sands below, you can see beds dipping to the right. And I believe that there is some Dipping, yes, there's some definitely dipping to the left. So some of these have to be most likely tidal or could be other kinds of near shore, but basically tidal. So this is the Bridgeton channel on one side to the right side of the pit facing west. Uh, you can see that the channel is right there with the coarsest material at the base. There's meter scale. This is approximately a meter of this stick, maybe a little bit more, but there's about a meter of relief on this channel. Here is another channel showing you this pockmarked surface is the gravels, okay? And just for comparison, it's interesting as we look for the contact. This is the contact is taken somewhere in this pit. It's a big pit. So we have no idea where this particular photograph is from, but from Newell et al, showing you again, these pockmark kind of gravels on top of cross bedded sands. And this is what they identify as the Bridgeton Cohansi contact. So we are in agreement with Newell on that. So the channel we'll see here in the Bridgeton cutting down. So obviously these are Bridgeton gravels, but if you get your eye in here, right, you can see this surface coming in at a pretty high angle. Uh, about 40 degrees and coming in. So this is a channel with other channels in it. So this is the base of the channel with the gravels, but you can see this one uh, has, of course, this lag material, obviously the base, okay? And over here, it generally finds upward. And here there's, there are probably, we didn't look carefully enough, Pete, but I bet you would find some soils in amongst this Bridgeton material. And that's what we would look for when we go back. And it's quite distinct from these sands here, uh, which are cross bed. And we'll look at the cross bedding in that in a minute. If you go over to the west face, this is still, these are beautiful, uh, basically cross beds here, sigmoidal shaped cross beds within the Bridgeton formation. So here is not as gravelly. You don't see much gravel, but these are probably some kind of bars in a fluvial environment going uh so he, here they preferentially this is a, a west uh generally dip but some of these are dipping east but here they're basically dipping uh i should put on the direction here that said if this is uh looking uh on the north face what the directions are here they are here it's labeled that the the shingling we would call these shingled oblique cross beds 
they're dipping to the north by northwest. So just for reference, uh, when Owens used to map cross beds, he would only use the trough ones. Okay. And shoot down the, uh, you know, the base of the channel. Yeah. That's where he would do paleo directions. Just on the trough, he felt were more accurate than the planar tabular ones. Yeah. Well, you're not sure how the tabular ones, which direction are really truly right. pointing. Exactly. So the trough, he would just get shoot down the trough, you know. So... Well, if you look at these batting, this batting, you'll see it's a little bit different than what we'll see in the next uh, photo series of photographs below. But this is what you observe, a sharp erosional bases with coarse channel lag fills and finding upward. You saw Newell's description. And so we ended up, we'll ask the class, you know, what's the environment at that position? We'll talk about it for a while. Uh, as we move upward, uh, this is again back on the north face. This is where it's not a stain, but you can see these beds beautiful. So these are oblique to tangential. They're oblique here, truncated tops. They're coming down to a, a, a oblique bases. A couple more photographs of these. And I just drew them out here showing you the tangential bases coming up to the oblique. So what is you can see these dip, I measured the dip at about 10 to 20 degrees uh, to the west. It's the apparent dip, of course, you know, there could be to the northwest. Um, we were debating whether or not these were in fact Cohansi or Bridgeton. We rather convinced ourselves that these are in fact Cohansi. So I will actually take that off, okay? Um, and so, one of the questions for the class is what direction is the flow? So in this case, preferential direction is to the left, okay? Uh, which is basically uh, to, to the west, northwest, okay? So if you remember, the this would be preferentially more toward the onshore, but we'll see in a minute, that's what this figure here shows is that the flow direction is going here you get these oblique to, we don't have these good troughs here, uh, but these tabular cross beds with the flow direction to the left. So again, which way is the flow direction is labeled here. This is east, this is west to the west by northwest uh, here. But just below this, so this is the contact with the Bridgeton above that's why I said, Pete, it looks like there's some soils in here, too, if you look yeah. here. And this isn't modern soils. These, these are Miocene. But you can see the orange is the typical west dip. But here are beds that are dipping. So I drew this one in and drew this one in with the hammer. But you can see the direction here and the color variations that these are dipping eastward. So we have a little video here. And just below it, there's a couple of beds dipping east. These are tidal. <laughs> so that's what I pronounced. So again, the Kirkwood and Cohansey strike north by northeast. Uh, the Paleo shoreline parallels, the modern shoreline parallels this outcrop. So therefore, um, onshore is northwest, offshore is southeast. And so what we observe is both onshore and offshore uh, cross beds. And with the environment, we'll talk again about the environment of deposition. Uh, again, these were probably, as I just said, we're interpreting these as tidal. And it's similar to this outcrop here, which I've shown them the at least two or three times. So do you think that from Ben's knee to about, you know, that little plant is on the top, is it about 14 days? <laughs> He counted like, uh, you know, eight, and I said, no, there's a few more, nine, 10, 11, 12, six, eight, eight, eight. And I would say, you know, 12, 14 days. So very similar. These are cut and scour features um, in the near shore zone. So what do you think these are, P? Do you think uh, if you use Carter's model, what would you think that these kind of features, these tidal features are? Are these near shore bars or what? Uh, when you got the uh, high angle planar 
tabulars like uh, those would be, I believe, title in the uh, title channels. Title channels. Okay. Okay. So, so and there's usually you get the the laminated in the swash zone where you have the high energy. Yeah. You know, you get the uh, trough there too, but the these I believe were. Uh, I'd have to take his thesis back out again. Check one more time, quick. Carter. Yeah, I'll check that one more time, quick. But uh, I yeah, believe we, we. You know, his pictures unfortunately are in black and white from the year one. It was a, I wonder if anyone knows where the originals are. They're in my possession. His thesis. Oh, and you have color photographs. He never mm -hmm. took color. They're all black and white. But they're okay. better in the thesis than the ones in the in the published paper. So we should scan it. Right. And I think any of the planar tabulars are title channels. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll check one more time. So now we're going to move on. Pete came over here and dug into these sands and we'll have a look at it. So that's all sugar sands, right? Kirkland? Well, when we look at this, actually, so there's near the top, there's some coarse sands, but in general, these are fine and fine to medium sands, uh, cross bedded to heavily. These, all these po pock marks are staining with the staining is probably picking up burrows. So these are heavily burrowed, uh, which means that you've moved out of the shore face, maybe you're in the lower shore face at this point. Uh, no, out of the foreshore, upper shore face environments, you're out and getting onto the continental shelf. Um, we're going to move to the south side of the pit to look at this in more detail. So let's let's just look at this for a minute. Okay, so that's it. That's all we got. You can see these opaque, heavy mineral laminae. So in this case. These are dipping to the east, southeast, so they're dipping offshore. Uh, we're going to look at this bed in a little more detail going downward. Um, there's some hints of troughs here, and I'll draw them out in a minute. What Pete would call a grit bed, which is this poorly sorted bed. There's hints of these clay here, which looks like a kaolin and clay, which is quite likely a, uh, an exposure surface. This is an erosional surface interpreted as an unconformity separating these beachy sands above from these homogeneous, highly bioturbated shelf sands. Some of them may have thin clay drapes on them, telling us that we're starting to get into the lower shore face to offshore. Again, these homogeneous sands here on this face. I mentioned the pervasive iron staining. We had to clean this whole face off here. This is the first cemented bed. We weren't sure if this is in the Cohansey or the uh, or, or the Bridgeton, but it gives you a good feeling for, there's probably at least three units here, the Bridgeton, certainly the Cohansey, and then the Kirkwood. Uh, well, just on one minor note, those uh, black opaque minerals are typically ilmenite, and they were mined for ilmenite in certain pits to to thicken paints, so right. they, ha they have gone up to like 20% of the sand fraction, and they're typically deposited right in the shore face. Or in well, the so uh, where's the ilmenite sourced from? It would be sourced from the, I guess the Piedmont, you know, would come in, but it's deposited in, of course it's a heavy, it's like deposited with, with coarser grain sands. It's a little finer because it behaves hydrodynamically like a, coarser grain, mm -hmm. and uh, usually fall out in those laminated beds in, uh, you know, the shore face. Looks pretty spectacular. I mean, that's, as we see here, we'd interpret this as these planar seaward dipping black uh, opaque heavy minerals, which in this case is a ilmenite, um, as foreshore. Uh, drew at least one or two troughs you can see in here. These trough cross beds, as we'll see in the, uh, Facey's model for this is these are upper shore face. And then there's this lag material, the grit, so to speak, 
above the unconformity, which is marked by the hammer. And I think this is- Those opaque heavy minerals are dipping to the south by southeast that are clearly uh, foreshore deposits coming down to this gritty layer and a surface. So this may be, could be Kirkwood above, Certainly is Kirkwood below because there's a shelf sand going down into. Oh, look at that! Sand below, pretty homogenous. Each of those is a little burrow, I think. Um, okay, he's out of action, so we can use massive. Uh, but basically, this is, there's some kind of cycle there before we go into the cemented bed. And that's it for the trip. That's pretty good. That's a good summary. I think they'll enjoy that. 21 minutes. Yeah. yeah it's perfect.